Hello and welcome back to the Boxing Social Podcast with me, Rob Tebbett, joined again by the white rhino, Dave Allen. We're going to talk a little bit of heavyweight boxing, being the fact that you are a recently retired heavyweight, and it is heavyweight fight week, AJ Pulev, um, IBF mandatory title defense for Anthony Joshua. I think this is a good fight for Anthony Joshua to look good in. What do you think? Well, I really rate Kubla Pulev. But I really rate Kubrat Pula from a few years ago. What's he got left? How good is he at the minute? I don't know. He must be 40 years old. I actually quite like the fight, Rob. You know, everyone knows I like to moan about Joshua and stuff, but uh, I've got nothing to complain about. I think I think Pula's a good fight. Look at all the other weights about, all the ones that are uh, free and available to watch. Kubrat Pula will be pretty hype on the list of uh, who's available. I like it. I think it's a good fight. Let's go back. Right, let's talk about this. You, you mentioned Anthony Joshua. And the fact that you like a moan about Anthony Joshua, or the perception is that you like a moan about yeah. Anthony Joshua. Explain that. You're recently retired. I'm not allowed to go to the yeah. AJ fight anyway, so I won't tell him. Well, I've, I've, I've known him a long time. Uh, I, was his, I was his lead sparring partner, effectively, for London 2012. I'd only had 10 amateur fights. I was up on the Great Britain on the assessments, and I uh, pestered Ron McCracken for weeks. I said, let me spar him. I said, come on. I said, come on. He's like, Dave, you know, he's like, he's like, no, 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 he's very good. I said, I don't care how good he is. Anyway, I was with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, we're in the car on the way to her house. I got a phone call off a number. I thought, who's this? It's a true story, this. Answered the phone. I don't use the answer numbers. I don't know. I went, hello? He went, Dave? He went, it's Rob McCracken. I went, you right, Rob, what's up? Do you want to come to Spartan Anthony tonight at four o'clock? It's about half on at this point. I said, do I? Put the phone down. Uh, went to her house, went back to my pitch and clothes up, went straight over, sparred him four rounds. Great. Sparred all right. It's what, it was what it was. Uh, from that point on, I sparred him to, I think, the Kevin Johnson fight. So that's three years. Um, and we sparred, we sparred sometimes four rounds. Sometimes I'd do four, Fraser Clark would do four, or Joe would do four, I'd do four. But I was pretty much there over that three year period. I, I was there a hell of a lot. I must have done. Between 500 and 800 rounds, you know, I would calculate. Some some days it'd just be me doing 10 rounds on my own. Um, and I guess I got a beer in my bonnet because I never got paid for it, which at the time I didn't really realise it was a thing to get paid for sparring. My expenses were never covered from getting there. Sometimes I sometimes I would be on the train. Sometimes my girlfriend would take me. Sometimes my Marsden would take me when, I, when he was training me. Train, travel expenses were never covered. And more than that, I remember sparring him at one point. I sparred him for about six, a six-month period. I sparred him two or three times a week. and had a broken nose the whole time. My nose was flat on my face. I've got great pictures of my nose flat on my face. And uh, and I'd just go and spar. And no one would ever say, you shouldn't be here. Just sort your nose out. They're just using me as a piece of meat. I was just getting beat up, you know, for nothing. And at the time, I was just happy. I was, when he won the gold medal, I was as happy as anyone. I was so happy, proud. And I was proud of myself a little bit. Yeah, I'm involved in that a little bit. I was so involved when he boxed the uh, Camarelli and and um, you know when Savon in the first round. So I was really involved, and um, I'm very proud to spar him. You know, he was a nice fellow. We got on really well. But uh, over time, when I started sparring Klitschko, Spielka, going all over the Europe, sparring and sparring Fury, and they were trying to pay me and pay my expenses and. and on top of that, pay me on top of that as well, and you know, uh, wearing big gloves and Vaseline, and you know, I couldn't spar with an injury or whatever else. I thought, you know what, maybe not Anthony's fault, but whoever was looking after him, I just think, I look back now at twenty eight, and I think, I took the piss really, effectively. Um, so anything I've ever said over the years about him, never said anything personal about him because I don't know him on a massive personal level, at least especially in the last five years, I don't know anything about him, but. Uh, Anything that I've said is my opinion on stuff like when he boxed with the first time. But uh, people always say, have you got a bit of a problem with him? I've got a problem with him, but I, di- I didn't like, I, looking back now, I don't like I don't like what went down years ago. And, that, and that's about it, really. Do you think that part of that is due to the fact that, I mean, you're a retired fighter now, so we can talk about it now. Do you feel like you left a good part of yourself in those gym wars, in oh, those gym spars? Me and Anthony would knock the fuck out of each other. <laughs> More often than not, he'd be knocking a lot of me. But uh, I used to go up there and I used, I used to oh, I'd try like nobody's business. I'd be I was trying to kill him all the time. That's what I was like. I, people look at me now and I'm a really nice, cuddly man. I was an angry man <laughs> back in my early 20s. I wanted to hurt everybody. And I'd go in and I'd try and take his head off and 
I had, I had a broken, like I said, I had a broken nose about six months at one point. I just barred it the whole time. Every time I got punched, I could just taste chlorine in my mouth, on my nose. Every time I got hit. Um, on top of that, on the other days I weren't there, on, you weren't there, I sparred Joe Joyce and Fraser Clark. Six rounds, eight rounds. I, yeah, I left. I, by the time I got to 27 years old, I'm shot to bits. I've only had 10 amateur fights, 25 pro fights, I'm shot to pieces. Because I've been sparring him. For nothing, for nothing at all, for nothing, you know. And in the end, and you know what? In the end, we 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 there was no bad blood or anything, but there was a few things said that I didn't like, and I'm pretty sure he don't like me either. But um, but yeah, but that is what it is, you know. I've got, I've got no hard feelings towards him. I just, just looking back, lessons learned, you know. I don't regret anything that's ever happened to me because. I used to say Danny all the time. Dan, Danny now turned pro, one and know. He'll never make the same mistakes I've made. People that I will train and manage in the future, they'll never make the same mistakes I've made. Lessons learned in blood are often uh, not forgotten. And I learned all mine in blood, so I don't forget any of them. <laughs> <laughs> every every lesson I've ever learned in, in life from being a young man, I learned in blood, Rob, so I don't forget any of them. And that's why I'm going to be a great trainer and manager, because I've learned the hard way and I don't forget anything. The interview that you did, we actually randomly just spoke about this because you wanted to know how high up on the list you were for Boxing Social. Uh, you're actually the most interviewed fighter, active fighter on Boxing Social. We've had to narrow it down because you started at the top of the list and you've been slowly beaten by a load of YouTubers. Uh, but the interview that we did the day after Joshua Ruiz won, I still get, or we still get comments about it now and tweets about it now with people, or anytime that you say anything about Anthony Joshua, it's, oh, but you told Anthony Joshua he should quit and move to an island. You didn't say that. I said if I was him, I would. If you were him, <laughs> you would quit and go and live on an island, which is, of course, very different to you saying if, Anthony if, Joshua should go and live on an island. If I had a tenth island. of his money, you'd never see him again. <laughs> but um, I've, got, I've got unbelievable amount of respect for him. And again, this is going to sound like a dig, but it's not. This is a great compliment. He hasn't got any real natural talent for boxing. Great athlete. He just grafted. When I first sparred him for the Olympics, um, sounds a mad thing to say, but he was very average. I can't believe he won an Olympic gold medal because he was average. He was poor, to be honest. And I look at him now and I think, unbelievable what he's achieved and done. Just, just through graft. That man's just grafted and grafted. Uh, for 12 years on where he is, you know, on top of being a great athlete anyway. But he's just grafted. So I've got I've got an unbelievable amount of respect for him. And also, I mean, we've spent a good part of today talking about Daniel Dubois and Anthony Yard and what they can do to come back, what they can do to kind of get over these, for Daniel Dubois in particular, a very, you know, humbling first career defeat in, in very, very, you know, dire circumstances you only have to look at Anthony Joshua and the, you know the the Ruiz one fight out in New York and see how he rebuilt himself and you can't not be impressed by that whether you're a Fury guy whether you're an AJ or a Wilder guy or whatever you can't not be impressed with how he was able to respond to losing in such a you know, humiliating circumstances call it what it was you know that that was a his big breakout fight in America Anthony Joshua comes to Madison Square Garden and he gets you know, beat up. And the fact that he come back from that in the way that he did is very, very impressive. I, I was in New York and Ruiz beat him. And when Ruiz dropped him the first time, I was stood there and I thought, okay, th let's see what he's got. Anyway, after six rounds, Ruiz stopped him and I, uh, I probably had a little smile and I thought, right, let's see, and then we'll see what he's got now. You know, it's interesting. Right, let's see what he's got. The rematch comes around, and he boxed it off for 12 rounds. Did something we never thought he could do. And I remember sat there, and I, I, I watched the fight, I can't remember I watched the fight with. And I said to him, so that's absolutely brilliant what he's just done. And I said, I'm aware a lot of people think I don't like him, whatever else. Um, don't dislike him, I don't, I don't even know him anymore. You know, I used to know him, I don't know him now. And I, I just literally remember watching the rematch all the way through, just, and I just, outstanding, brilliant. Coming back from the Ruiz fighters, did he quit? You know, like Daniel did, like I did against Price. You know, no shame in it. He quit, and look what he came back and did. And I remember just sat there, and I have to applaud him. So it is what it is. But uh, but yeah, well, I, I, well done to him. I hope he continues to win because he's great for British boxing. You know. 
He certainly is. Um, just to echo that, I, I didn't think he was capable of boxing that type of fight for 12 rounds. I thought he was going to have to hold his feet a little bit more in that rematch and potentially gain Ruiz's respect more than he had to in the end. But that was, I think, a combination, not to take anything away from Anthony Joshua, but a combination of Ruiz's inability to really force him to fight. He kind of waddled around the ring for 12 rounds and wasn't able to to force him to throw. But this is why I think the, the Kubrat Puller fight is actually a good fight for Anthony Joshua to, to go back to the AJ of old, the kind of AJ destroyer. Puller was very much upright, very, you know, that, that classic European style as you mentioned, I don't think he's he's anywhere near the fighter that he once was, even going back a few years and when he boxed Huey Fury. No. Um, we saw him kind of labor against Bogdan Dino. Um, he went the distance with Rydell Booker, who obviously just been smashed by Philip Hergovich, lost to James Tony in 2004, which is what I always like to, <laughs> to tell people. Ex-middleweight uh, James Tony beat him in 2004. So I think that Personally, Kubrat Pulev is there for for Anthony Joshua to make that transition back now from, you know, is he ever going to be... I personally think he's... I don't know if you'd agree. He's changed since the Klitschko fight. So I don't think we'll ever kind of see the old Anthony Joshua pre-Klitschko destroyer, but I do feel like this is a good fight for him to to go back to AJ, the KO show, the KO artist. Well, he's a better fighter now than he was a few years ago. It's like, Lennox, look at Lennox Lewis. After the after them call job, it... Lately, it ended up being gun shy, to be honest. He ended up being scared to death, but it made him harder to beat. It made him a better fighter, mm-hmm. you know. Apart from the the Rackman fight where he took his eye off the ball, you know, he beat everybody, didn't he? It, did, it was quite boring in the end, to be honest, apart from a few fights, the Briggs fight and a few others. He, he, was, he was pretty boring, but um, that's what that's what Anthony's doing. You know, the Reese fight, it was boring. You know, if you want to see his blood and guts, it was boring, but as a boxing man, I watched it and um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed it very much. But um, I think pula has got a good job. I think he's a very big man with a good job. He's a very big man with a good job. You're hard to beat. Um, I don't think he's cut and dry at all. I don't think it is. You know, people always say to me, "Oh, you sparred, you sparred Anthony. What was? Is he good at this? Is he good at that?" I said, "I've not sparred him for five and a half years. Mm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I dream, you know. The improvements is that vast, and a man that trains hard in five and a half years is a totally different fighter altogether. So I, I don't know. From personal experience, I couldn't tell you. I can only tell you what I can see on the TV now. And um, I, I don't. I don't think I have it all his own way. To be honest, I'd be very surprised if he does. I'll be surprised. I'd, I wouldn't say I'd be surprised if he doesn't have it all his own way. I think maybe a KG one or two rounds to start off with. And I think um, once AJ's starting to find his range, touch him with the jab and line up the right hand, I think he'll um, I think he'll look good. Um, I w- what I will say, I'll give him, if he beats Pule, I'll give him credit for it because he'd be, a, he'd be a very good fighter in my opinion. So that's not me being negative, saying, oh, well, I don't think he'll win or you don't think he's any good. I'm just saying if he wins... Got to give him some credit. It's better than me saying I think he'll win easy and giving him no credit. Do you know what I mean? So I'm happy with it. I'm really happy with the fight. Actually, that he's fighting Pure Eleven. He's not fighting. Um, he's not fighting a few of the others. He could have fought. Sergei Kuzmin on the undercard against Martin Bacoli. Yeah. Interesting fight. Very, that, that's very, very uh, piqued a lot of people's interest. Yeah. Um, how much of Martin do you know? Have you sparred Bacoli? Well, the last time I seen Anthony in person, I sparred Martin that day. I was having a shocker of a day that day, Rob. Let me tell you. Ed fell off completely. Ed up my ass. Anyway, 2017. I think it was before um, before Anthony box Takam. I think at the time it was still down to fight. Was it Parker? Pulev. 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 Yeah, Pulev, they yeah. pull out. So. so anyway, I go to Sheffield. Mick said, "Do you want to spar Anthony Joshua?" I went. Did not really. No, I don't. He went well. You're boxing in three or four weeks. Perfect preparation. It's all right. Fair enough. I'm fighting a southpaw, but fuck it. Anyway, so uh, got in the car, went down. This is a funny story as well. So anyway, so I'm stood there, yeah, getting ready to spar. Me, Mick, Heather was there. I can't remember why Heather was there. I think my old man, I think my old man had come to watch as well. So anyway, Anthony's going around. What was Heather doing there? She, I think she brought my old man to, for the sparring. So anyway, Anthony going around shaking everybody's hand in the whole place. Yeah, everyone's there. All, everyone, the GB set up, it's quite busy all the time. So anyway, he, he gets to make shakes and gets Heather, takes her hand, whatever. He looks at me and me and him, me and him looked at each other. Both <laughs> both looked away from each other and just, just a little one of them. Do you know what I mean? I thought, yeah. I thought he don't like me either. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, so that day, um, I got in, there was four of us. It was me, Bacoli, a Coley 
and Joshua. So Rob said, look, we'll just mix it up. I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to be there in the slightest. I was miserable as anything. And it didn't help through the first two rounds, Lawrence had called and I never hit him. So I mean, that did nothing to better my mood <laughs> at all. So anyway, I called him that thing. I said to me, I said, me, I said, fuck this. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was, I was dying a bit. I was under 17 stone and I felt like shit. I said to Mick, I said, oh, well, what's next? I was saving myself a bit as well because I wanted to sit with Joshua inspiring. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try anyway. Anyway, he said, all right, Lawrence, getting with, uh, get with Anthony and David, you squad with Martin. So I thought, all right, Martin gets in the ring with me. He's arguing with Billy Nelson. He's going, he's going to Billy. I don't want to spar him. I want to sp I've come to spar Joshua. What do I want to spar him for? So I looked at Billy and I went, Billy, what do you want me to do? The bell went, Martin went, no, I don't want to spar. So I looked at Billy and said, what do you want me to do? And, he, and Martin, Billy's going, come on, Martin, spar, come on. And I went, so what do you want me to do? do me, are we sparring or not? So I'm not really asked, but I didn't want to run anyway. Anyway, Martin was, all right, I'll spar. So all right, whatever. Started sparring, like walking away from me, muttering to himself. Billy's talking to him. Next thing you know, he starts firing off these six bunch combinations on my head. <laughs> so, so anyway, I walked away and I said, I said we, we are sparring then? So anyway. He continues moaning and muttering. Continues to fill me in. So yeah, I thought, what the, I thought, what the fuck is going on? So that was only two rounds with Martin, yeah? And to be honest, he was really talented, to be honest. And I, I, never, I never even tried to hit him. So we did them two rounds with him. And I was really thinking about him. And then, uh, so I thought, I've right, done two of him, two of him. All right, I'll spar with Joshua now. And, um, and then Rob went, right, Martin, you get back in with Joshua. David and Lawrence, you're done. That was it. <laughs> but what the fuck? And that was the last time that you went up there. Like, I would never. I wouldn't. And I said that day on the way home with me, I'm never going back up there again. Never a fucking again. So what a waste of time. I only found me, and uh, I don't think I, I don't think I was spotted for another six days in the gym. Martin Bacoli is a. Um, he's unbelievably talented. Though, yeah, yeah, and he's yeah, an he's, cool. he's an interesting one as well. Obviously, we all saw what happened against um, Michael Hunter. I think he's done very well to rebuild yeah, since yeah. then. Um, credit to him for that there will always remain a question mark for me until he he proves that he can fight a Michael Hunter type fighter and have success in that fight um, the Michael Hunter fight was actually very one-sided uh, people people think about the the ending to the fight and the dislocated shoulder and what have you and forget that Michael Hunter was was winning that fight at a canter I think I remember at the time the scorecards being all over the place and being you know, terrible scorecards, but I, I don't see how anyone could watch it and think anything different. But that's probably the concern for me with with Martin Bacoli is facing a smaller heavyweight, somebody who can nip around him. He doesn't strike me as somebody who has particularly fast feet. He's lazy. He boxed Lucas Rustovich who I stops in 30 seconds. And one of the fights I watched, uh, I watched Martin boxing. And Martin didn't do a thing. Do you know what I mean? Didn't do a thing, couldn't be asked. He watched Camille Sarkovsky, was the same. He's lazy. Um, he was heavy for the Michael Hunter fight as well yeah if he's heavy with Cusman he gets beat if he's heavy he gets beat he gets stopped again career over effectively if he's in good shape um, if he's in good shape and everything's alright I, I think he probably he probably beat Cusman like I said he's one of the best I've been in with he was on it was, I, I, like I said I sparred him it was the weirdest spar I've ever done because I weren't sure whether to hit him back or not I weren't sure, I weren't sure if we were sparring or what Super talented. You can see that when he boxes. A is lazy and B is on top fire. If he's on top of you, like if he gets on top of Kuzman here and he gets confident, he'll beat Kuzman. If Kuzman has success early and gets him up close and roughs him up, Kuzman wins. Simple as that. That's how I see it. I mean, with it, like Kuzman, while obviously losing to Michael Hunter, it's kind of like in this era of big heavyweights and like the modern heavyweights is actually the little nippy guys coming up from cruiserweight yeah. who are the perfect antidote for those guys yeah, and people always talk about you know how are they going to deal with the big guys talking about alexander usik and michael hunter how are the big guys going to deal with yeah. these these yeah. guys you know nipping around them and, and kind of they're very very difficult to catch these cruiserweights yeah. coming up but sergey kuzmin very established amateur Stop Joe Joyce in the amateurs. In the round, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is no mean feat, no matter, you know, amateurs a long time ago and whatever, but still, you yeah. know, stopping Joe Joyce is no mean feat, no matter when you do it. I think that's a really good fight. I do I think, think it's a, it's a, really think it's a great fight, yeah. And, uh, you know, saying Martin is lazy and, and on top fighter, which which I think he is, still a really good fight. If he wins this, he puts, must put him in the top 10 in the world, you know. And for all the things that Billy does and says, 
he backs his man, and I can't knock him for that. Yeah, and also with, knock, with, with Billy, it. with Billy, it's kind of similar to what we were talking about with Tundi earlier. Yeah, <laughs> Whether you saying. like Billy yeah. Nelson or not, he's banging the drum, and you know, yeah, can't knock him, can't knock him for doing what he's doing. Mm. Uh, and Saturday we'll see, because it make a break from for mine. If he loses to Guzman, he's done. You know, he's got not got a fan base here. He's not. Do you know what I mean? They he, would take a a significant rebuild, and you know, no one's going to go near him. He loses to Guzman. Do you want to fight Mike McCauley? No. Why? <laughs> Would so, be the yeah. answer. So he's one, he's one defeat away from obscurity, and that and that's the truth of it. So hopefully he's in good shape. Hopefully he gets a foothold in the fight early, gets some confidence, and I, and I think he'll shine. If he doesn't, I think he'll get beat. And it's also well, you know, you mentioned that about Bacoli. It's the same for Sergo Kuzmin. If Kuzmin loses that fight, then it's interesting to see where he goes because he's no spring chicken anymore. No. He's already lost. So if he's Losing to a Martin Bacoli, then you have to kind of wonder where he's going to go. Yeah. Huey Fury versus Marius Vac. That doesn't seem like the best fight in the world to me. I was begging for the Wack fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know when I was on the box hammer, I said to Ed, Ed was like, who's on the box? I said, I want you to box a former world title challenger. He said to me, that's what Ed said. A former world title challenger. I said, all right. I said, like who? Molina. I said, all right. Yeah, Molina. Yeah. Do, do, do happens. Um, if you were, and I went, I went, Ed, you know who's perfect? Murray is back. I said, because he bought Dylan White when Dylan White was two stone overweight and not bothered. And I said, Murray's fat's completely shot to pieces and finished and done. I said, I will box Murray is back. <laughs> That's why you want I said, to I will fight. box him, please. <laughs> but this is why Dave has now retired. Um, that was one of the reasons again. Because exactly. Because my confidence was shot and I only wanted to box people that I knew I could win because my confidence was completely gone. I think Yui Fiori will look spectacular against Murray's fight. I think he'll stop him. Really? I think Yui Fiori will stop Murray's fight, yeah. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't stop Murray's fight. Very surprised. I spoke to Peter the other week and um, I think I think you I think you will stop Murray's fight. I'd be surprised if he doesn't. I think stylistically to me it's sort of it, yeah, it's, it's terrific. It screams sparring session to me, really. That's what it looks like stylistically. Marius Vax cute, he knows how to look after himself. Huey's not known as being a big puncher, kind of boxes a little bit one paced at times. If he stops him, I'll be surprised. I think he'll stop Marius Vax. I think he'll stop him. Genuinely. And I think I'll stop Marius Vax as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um you mentioned We've spoke about um, you sparring Anthony Joshua and yeah. Fraser Clark and those guys. Obviously, you spent some time in the Fury camp yeah. training with Peter Fury. What was that whole experience like? Peter's a friend of mine. You know, me and Peter uh, from 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 from, uh, from day one of me and Peter, we eat it off. I was only a twenty one year old kid at the time, and uh, I always said um, Brendan Ingle aside, Peter Fury is the one man that I've respected. Listen to, um, I, I run through brick walls for him when I train with him. Peter, I've been doing some, <laughs> some horrific things that no one else has got me doing. So on a personal level, me and Peter, I saw him uh, in the when Savannah, Savannah box. He trained mm. Savannah, didn't he? Savannah's a good friend of mine. We was in the bull with me and Peter, and uh, we spoke a lot, and we had a couple of hours together uh, one of the nights, and we were just catching up and talking about talking about our lives and whatever else. And I really enjoyed it. I really liked Peter. Uh, and as for the training, the training was hard, you know. <laughs> I was there. I had, I had a one camp with him. I went back as a sparring partner a few times. Um, I sparred lots with Yui, sparred lots with Tyson, Eddie Chambers, Michael Sweeney, Rico Verhoeven, the K1 superstar. Had some good, had some really good times, you know. I got, I got to uh, Tyson Fury, superstar, innit? I got, I, I was living with him at one point. You know what I mean? I, Another crazy chapter in my life, I guess that 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 time there was. But uh, Peter, Peter's um, unbelievable man, you know. And um, he backs you, he backs you to, to the hilt again, you know. Father and son, but still trainer and boxer, you know. And he got all the belief in the world in him. And um, I do believe it's not Mary's fight. I think um, I think we're gonna see a different you than what we've seen in uh, in years gone by. I think we need to because I think we will. the Marius back. Fight. I think at this point of Marius Vax's career, anything other than a resounding clinical performance, whether it, I think he has to stop him to look good, you know. Um, I think if the fight goes the distance, I think it will resemble something of a sparring, mm. a sparring session. Um, but back to Peter, 
he's a, you know fascinates me because I don't know Peter at all. Um, Andy does all the interviews with Andy's kind of like the boxing social representative for the Furies. He's got <laughs> John Fury's um, uh, you know gets on with Andy. Peter Fury gets on with Andy. Um, so he's kind of like our our Fury guy. Um, but I'm always fascinated to to kind of hear or, or get an insight into to Peter Fury in particular. Uh, what sort of stuff did he have you doing? He strikes me as a as a firm man in the gym. Well, I've been around Tyson um, all his career, effectively. You know, as a sparring partner. You know, I was in his camp for a little while, being trained by Peter, but I've been around as a sparring partner while well, there's a, a few different coaches. And um, the only man that I've ever seen, not control Tyson, but Tyson would listen to. And when Peter talks, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm listening. You were giving that look to just so he knows he's listening. And he had Tyson uh Tyson would listen to him and respect him. You know. He's got um he's not a shouter, Peter. Never I, he never shouted once. Apart from at David Higgins that one time. Yeah, exactly. That. That's why that's why he don't want to get a shout now. <laughs> but Peter, yeah, he would never shout, never never raise his voice. He just did what he said. You know, he um his training methods uh, dif- different again, but different things work for different people. How do you mean different? Because he's he's very much of the old school. Of course, yeah. He once took us on a on a <laughs> on a mini bus. Tyson wasn't there that day. Me, Huey, Isaac Lowe, Eddie Chambers, Rico Verhoeven, and uh, that's, that's, that's such a blend of characters. And, by the and way. young Huey, Tyson's little brother yeah, Huey. Yeah. So we're all on the coach. Uh, Peter's there as well, and. Uh, this army guy called Will, who's our, our strength conditioning. So anyway, it's all right, we're getting on, getting on the minibus, eight of us. Rico Verhoeven, 6'5", kickboxing world champion, superstar. Eddie Chambers at the time, world title challenge heavyweight. Me, just starting out, eyes are low the same, you are the same. So anyway, we're on this thing. So where are we going? Southport Beach. Right, okay. wonder what we're doing. Looking out the window, it's freezing, it's raining. Right. <laughs> Not down at the beach then. Anyway, get there. And the boat was right. We're going to some, uh, go and uh, run some sand dunes. I thought, all right, I can do that. You know, you run up a sand dune, you walk back down, you have a rest, you go again. I don't mind doing that. So, all right, we're going to we're gonna run to the sand dunes. I thought, all right. We set off to the sand dunes. Anyway. On the way there, we're running through mud. We're <laughs> it wasn't a beach. It was a beach, but it was also sand dunes and grass and a public foot path, like a big path. We get to the sand dunes, just some sand dune sprints. We've done enough sand dune sprints, in my mind, for it to be a full session. Right, so I thought, all right, I've done them, tired. All right, let's get back, I'm freezing. Right, no, no, no. We're going to run now to the beach. I thought, all right, half hours the beach, away. can't be far, surely. Run to the beach. Right, this is what you're going to do. David, get Rico, put him over your shoulders and and uh, and run to uh, this this mark in the ground. <laughs> I said, what? I said, what, what, what do you mean? Rico's massive. Yeah, anyway, I've got Rico on my shoulders like this. <laughs> Carried him to the thing. Knackered legs have gone. Went right, Rico. Pick David up, carry him. When he picked me up and was running with me on his shoulders, I thought I wish I'd drive him on my shoulders. I thought fucking bollocks, we can kill him. <laughs> so anyway, carried him back. So right, what's next? Right, I want you and uh, Rico to uh, wrestle each other on the beach. I thought, what? I thought, come on. Anyway, half an hour of me carrying him, him carrying me, all all the rest of it. Right, what are we doing now? Right, we're gonna, we're gonna run back now to the coach. Oh, that's all right. Must be about three mile. Peter said, I'm going to run as well. So I remember, I said, I was laughing with Peter the other week. So that's Peter. Peter said, I'm, I'm, I'll run back with you. Run at my pace. I thought, all right, brilliant. Peter sets off 100 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 and, I, and anyway, so after about, after about a couple hundred yards, I was going to slow down in a minute because I was struggling. Anyway, <laughs> about half a mile later, <laughs> he's still going at the same pace, Peter. So I'm looking at him, <laughs> thinking, what is he doing? Anyway, so after about a mile, um, we stopped. Oh, thank God for that. So I was really struggling. I couldn't believe the pace he was running at. Anyway, we got to this, um, it was like a, a stream of water, but deep though, about four or five foot deep. And there's a bridge over it. So I thought, all right, we're going to walk over the bridge and probably start running again. So I thought, all right, anyway. No, no, no. Right, David, jump in this, jump, <laughs> in, jump in the stream and swim under the water, under, under the, under the bridge. I said, I can't swim. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just walk, just, just crouch and walk underneath. Crouch and what there's pictures of me, muddy water all over my face, underwater, swimming like walking under a bridge full of water. Go out the other side, and then we all ran to the coach. About minus three, this was <laughs> the craziest thing ever, you know. <laughs> but with Peter, you do things like that. We used to spar in the in a kids' 
park. I remember spotting Tyson Fury in the kids in the kids park. Yeah, spotting you and Tyson in a park in Bolton. Pete and obviously boxing inside out. Do you know what I mean? I quite enjoyed how I was doing it and the drawing that I've done with Danny in years gone by I've been like what Peter did because you know what, if you can do it in a kids play area <laughs> you can do it in a ring where you got you got nice underfoot conditions and you're not gonna worry about looking like a nonce or whatever, you know, <laughs> in your in your Christ wear the tightest pants in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so uh I used to you know what, more than anything else, I used to love being around Peter, being around him. Cause that kind of fella he, he's always got a great story to tell. You know, he's always got a smile on his face. And the time over there, I really enjoyed training there. But the training was mental at times. Sounds like a far cry from Champneys with Darren Barker. Probably why I got beat by David Price. <laughs> <laughs> I think the prize come the first too easy, Jesus. It was the, I was on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing you on your Instagram stories around that time and thinking, he doesn't look like he's training very hard. You know what? When you I, were and you weren't. When I boxed Lucas Brown, I trained unbelievably hard. I never had any time off. I was I was all fizzled out halfway through. And when Champions kicked us out, <laughs> which they did eventually for our behaviour, me had gone. But uh, yeah, I've got some stories about Champions as well, but there's yeah. stories I can't tell. <laughs> we'll keep them for the book. <laughs> um, try and round off the card. Um, Lawrence Acoli is going to be fighting, um, I forgot his first name now, uh, Jezuski. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how well versed you are on Polish cruiserweights. I know a few of them. Right. Because I was in the gym sparring Spielka. Of course, yeah. And Krzysztof Glowacki was there. And okay, it's a yeah. shame that that fight isn't happening. That was really a great fight. fight. Yeah, great really fight. Really good fight. That's um, a shame. And I think we would have seen, you know, I, I am a believer that once Lawrence Okoli yeah. fights the the better guys with the respect to the, the opponents that he's faced so far, the more he goes up the levels, I think we'll see the best of him. And I think that was a really good fight. And I feel like that would have Great told fight. us a lot about Lawrence Okoli, yeah. but it's not going to be that. Kind of while we're, I mean, we're talking a lot about sparring, so we might as well talk about um, you sparring Lawrence Okoli, because I know you have. What's that like being in with him? I, oh. I'd imagine it's sort of like trying to wrestle a six foot six octopus. He's not supposed to. Yeah, that was a word I was looking for. He's. Uh, I I don't I didn't enjoy sparring him at all. Um, because when I'm sparring him, I think when he's eight weeks out from a fight, he must be sixteen stone plus. Yeah, he's a big unit. You're effectively he's, he's an heavyweight. You know, the only time he's ever not a heavyweight is on the weight. It's on the scale. Mm. You know, uh, very strong. Uh, punches very hard uh, it's just awkward you know he's awkward he's not nice to watch but he's even he's even less nice if that's how you say it to, to, to be in there with he's, he's horrific horrible 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 man he's just uh, to, I remember 2011 me and he was in the boys clubs and he was he was a super heavyweight and I was the heavyweight slash cruiserweight as a pro I was 14 40 he'd be about 16 stone and I won the boys' clubs. It was my eighth fight, and I think he only had four or five. And I remember my old man saying to me, "You know what, David? Lerone might have been the best fighter on this card, but you'd have beat the super heavyweight. They were terrible." On about uh, Lauren Sokoli, and the kid called Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong, I think that's what they called. They called him not yeah, the Henry Armstrong. I don't think it was him. No. <laughs> anyway, my dad said, "So you'd have beat the super heavyweight, still poor." This is Lauren Sokoli. So anyway. Couple of years, uh, maybe not about 18 months, two years later, he was on the Great Britain squad. 2016, he's gone to the Olympics. Uh, we no experience at all. He looked terrible when he was in the boys, because he only had four fights and got buys all the way through. He's another one of the same uh, as, as Anthony Joshua. Just graphs. Unbelievable hard worker. And the improvement that's come with that is, is so vast. I think he still does suffer a little bit from his, his, with his inexperience. You know, the Matty Asking fight showed that. Uh, but. Again, when I first met in 2011 to where he is now, got nothing but respect for the graft he's put in and the improvements he's shown. I really rate him. You know, I expect him to be this replacement, you know, of course, as he should be him, and he's a world champion, you know. Then hopefully he gets the Glovacki fight and, and he's a, then, he, then he's a proper world champion, I guess. But um, I wish him all the best again. Got a soft spot for him. I've been, I've been, I remember him when I first met him. He was chubby, big chubby kid. Um, it wasn't very good and look at him now so brilliant yeah I mean it really is testament to um to the work that he's put in in such a short space of time and it, you're right it is very similar to Anthony Joshua I remember he tells the story of kind of 
being a fat guy working at McDonald's and seeing AJ on the TV and it inspired him to kind of turn his life around. And everybody I speak to who's sparred Lawrence Acoli, been in the ring with him, all say the same thing. He's an absolute nightmare to be in the ring with. Um, speak to his trainer, Shane McGuigan, and and it's just about really transferring what they see in the gym to fight night now, mm. um, where I think by his own admission, he's let the, the big stage... I wouldn't say get to him. He's a very he's a very confident, very you know loud, boisterous, braggadocious character. Yeah. But something on fight night when those light goes on, those lights go on, you know, it, it takes something from him. The Matty Askin fight. I mean, the Matty Askin fight and the Isaac Chamberlain fights were two of the worst fights. It, experience, though. yeah. But Just again, it's it, it's not being able to translate what you're doing in the gym on fight night because he's had I think a combined 40 odd fights yeah, crazy how, crazy how, or how, something stupid that, yeah. like that it's um, it's ridiculous and, and when you consider that he's about to fight well, he's not going to fight for a world title this weekend but after the fight and provided he comes through successfully he'll be boxing Christoph Glavatsky who's a very very capable fighter for the world title in you know four years or three years after turning professional so all credit to him oh, yeah because, because of his style he's um you know, he's not looked at as as um as what he is, which is potential. There's no reason why why um you know Bradis and the likes pack up in the season. There's no reason why Lawrence couldn't win every belt. To be honest, he, yeah, he could be that good if you look at the experiences. But given, given the Glovaki fight, given the fight side, even one or two of us, the experience to go with, with his ability. I don't see no reason why he couldn't do that. To be honest. Yeah, no, and because he's boring, everyone's like, "Oh, he's not that good. He's brilliant." But it's effective. Yeah, that, 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 that's what really comes down to effectiveness. Yeah, again. yeah and yeah. I asked Lawrence once. I asked him after the um, the Matty Askin fight because I, you know he'd said I think AJ had come out and done an interview or something where he said you know it's the entertainment business as well, and obviously he looks after Lawrence. And I, I kind of put that to Lawrence and said, you know, would you rather? win ugly and get told you're shit and you're boring and nobody wants to watch you fight mm. or are you gonna you know open yourself up and you know potentially try and put a few more bums on seats and being a bit more exciting and he was very very good in his answer he said look i would love to be more exciting i would love for people to love watching me fight but at the end of the day the most important thing is winning the fight and i've yet to really see him you know, lose a lot, lose really any rounds. I can't yeah. really remember anybody winning rounds against Lawrence Acoli as a professional. I mean, the Askin fight, I don't think there was any winners in any of the rounds. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a really terrible fight, as was the Isaac Chamberlain fight. But again, that was, as you mentioned, you know, the, ex the inexperience of both of them didn't help in that fight. Mm. Um, you know, headlining a show after, I think, less than 10 fights apiece. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that he will only develop through experience and I feel like one of the very first things Shane McGuigan said to me about Lawrence Ciccoli when he went to to train with Shane was when he gets up to heavyweight he's going to be a serious problem yeah can I've you see that? that yeah I think um, three or four years time I, I would be surprised to see um, Dubois and Ciccoli for the World Liverweight Championship and people watch this and say are you mad they spar a lot it would not surprise me in the slightest if them two are two of the best ever in the world in three or four years' time. Which is probably after last Saturday, with the boy losing as he did and with Lawrence currently not holding the Cruiserweight World Championship. It sounds mad, but I wouldn't surprise them two are the two of the best ever in the world in three or four years' time. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put anything past anything when it comes to boxing. Mm. Um, while we're kind of hovering around um, the heavyweight division, let's talk about Deontay Wilder. I haven't spoke about him with you for a long time. Um, a little bit bored of, of talking about the excuses and what have you that have come out since the fight. I'm sure everybody's bored of hearing it as well. Um, but yeah, uh, there's not really been too much talk about what's going to happen with him next. I think there's obviously the talk about AJ Fury. If not AJ Fury, then, then Joshua versus Alexander Usyk. But a strange old time for Deontay Wilder. There he is up on the wall. Yeah, he kind of forgot a man. Yeah. Uh, I forgot all about, about him, to be honest. I um, I love to see him come back and fight because it's exciting. You know, when he boxes, he's going to knock somebody out. And even if, and even if he doesn't knock him out, it's usually exciting. Stavern aside, even when he got beat by Fiori, it was exciting. The draw was an unbelievable fight. Very exciting fighter. Um, as you get older and you're in boxing a long time, I don't really care about these excuses and mm. these interviews and all these bollocks. I don't care. You know, the proof's in the pudding. Um, 
He's either got to come back and fight Tyson for the third time. If he loses, he's, he's career done. If he wins, great. Or he's got to just go a different route and and, um, and box. Yeah, there's some talk of like the yeah. Hellaniuses and people like that yeah, around. Why I'd love to see him box Hellanius. Why not box Hellanius? Hellanius uh, just had a good win as well. Yeah, box Hellanius, box Karanaki. If they put them two boxes, each other, box the winner. Box Fury again. Just box. You know, or don't you don't need you don't need to box. No need to box. I don't need to box again. I've probably got a lot less money than he has. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But uh, if you're smart, you don't need to. So he's just gonna. Um, I don't know. I don't really care. The truth is, I don't care what he does. Um, so glad that we brought him on to ask him. The great thing about boxing, and the bad thing about boxing is, it doesn't matter who you are. If Anthony Joshua retired tomorrow. In a week's time, no one would care. Because someone's going to take his place. You know? Someone else become a weight champion in the world. Who cares? I retired. Everyone ca- Everyone was so bad for two days. After that, who cares? Retired, I've gone. Alan Babbage is here now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the truth of it, though. You know? Don't take wild. No one cares about him. It wasn't in the news to come out of all these bollocks excuses. Then he's in the news again. Then everything it's forgot about. This is boxing. Fury, Wild, Josh Glow retire. Doesn't matter. Three other people are going to take the place. So it's the same, you know. We're not sat here talking about Ray Leonard, Hagler and Nairns anymore, are we? Because someone else comes up their place over time, not how great they are. So I don't, I just, I don't, just don't care. If he boxes again, great, I'll watch it. Love to watch him fight. If he doesn't, I'll watch someone else fight instead. I'll um, watch him fight Christopher Lovejoy. I won't. I don't want Lovejoy to get. I don't want Lovejoy to get paid. There's a few people that box. I think I don't really want them to get that fight. I don't want them to get paid. <laughs> and you know they are. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep that off here though. Um, and as long as it's not you, we're all good. Um, final one, we'll, we'll finish where we started on the main event, Anthony Joshua versus Kubrat Pulev. What is your official Dave Allen prediction? I'm going to go for a, a, a Joshua win between 7 and seven and 12. I want to say 7 and 9, but you know what? I'd like to be correct. I don't need to be too correct, just correct. I think I think a Joshua stop is 7 and 12. I think, uh, I think he'll break Pulev down. Not even. I don't think he'll break him down with a jab. I think he'll break him down by Pulev being old and Anthony being a little bit fresher. You know, I don't think Pulev's uh, legs will take. Uh, what Anthony can do. Anthony will be moving and be darting in and out. I don't. I don't think we're going to see Joshua the Destroyer. I think we're going to see a little bit more of Anthony from the Ruiz two fight. And I think Pulev's legs will fail him and Anthony will take him out uh, later on in the fight. Interesting. Well, we will wait and see this weekend. Anthony Joshua versus Kubrat Pulev for the IBF, WBA, WBO heavyweight championships of the world. Dave Allen, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for for coming back. Although Barry Jones um, is not grateful because he said that you've stolen his job. Um, Maybe we can get you to have a a charity spa and boxing social sometime soon. Well, the thing with Barry is he's got it all, but he's just not me, is (laughs) it? Real pleasure. Thanks very much for speaking to me today. And for you guys tuning in and listening, thanks very much as always. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another Boxing Social podcast. From me, Rob Tebbett, from him, Dave Allen. Thanks very much for stopping by.